Let's just get started. We're all ready? Thumbs up, Hannah? Okay, if, if Hannah's ready, then we're ready. Okay, all right. Now, first of all, welcome to CFC's English Worship Service, May 17th, 2020, as it says on our PowerPoint. It is good to see everybody here with us. Before we even begin, let us take a moment, everyone, to unmute yourself and say hi to everyone. Take a moment and unmute yourself and say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Good morning, Hello. everybody. Hi. hi Joshua, can you say hi? Hi, Hi, hey, Joshua. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello, my name, Baba. Yeah, you will. Good morning. Good morning. Mama, write my name. <laughs> Good job. Hello. All right. Hi, Bye. Sammy. It's good to see everybody here. All right, we're going to mute again. Everybody, please mute. So, welcome to CFC. Uh, EM worship service. This is Sunday morning, May 17th. A few announcements. Before I start the announcements, if you are new here and you haven't heard our announcements before and if you want more information, look at your chat. I sent you. If you are new and interested in knowing more about CFC, please feel free to email me at helicon at cfccsj.org and I'll quickly reply to you because I can see the email box right now. So if you have questions during the worship service or anything you need, send it to me. I'll be glad to answer them. Or you can also privately send it to me on the chat, okay? Uh, a few announcements today before I forget. Um, welcome, first of all. And, uh, one of our important ones is during the Sunday school hour, once a quarter, we do a town hall meeting as a church. And what it, the town hall meeting is, is a time for us to kind of hear about what's going on in our church at different layers, what we're, what we're doing, what is the plans for the future, and also what we are like maybe projects we're considering, or we want to highlight certain things. And so it's an opportunity to get to know the EM worship service and the Sunday service, and also the Sunday ministry and the church ministry as a whole. Um, and so we invite you to join us next Sunday. I think it's May 24th for our town hall meeting. It's going to be during our Sunday school hour on the adult Sunday school link. So I have it linked in our announcements I sent and posted on Facebook. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to message me about it. Okay. Second announcement is if you haven't received it and you signed up, our Journey Chapter 1 growth groups is live now. And I have sent every group, basically a group email for you to start to initiate the conversations. I have also ordered 35 copies of the book. Um, um, what is it called? <laughs> totally, brain, totally brain freeze. But anyways, if you are interested in buying A oh, Possibility of Prayer by John Stark. Um, if you are interested in buying the copy of the book, um, the, the information is on the link and in your email. And feel free to Venmo me or PayPal me for the book. It's $10, which is cheaper than even Amazon right now. And we got a bulk order. And so we have 35 copies. I'd love to get you guys your copies as well. So that's just the other announcement. And if you have any questions about Journey, I have a special live session where I'll kind of try to answer your questions on May 20th, Wednesday, um, at 8 o'clock. And I'll probably go for like 30 minutes. I'll just answer any questions about logistics, about why we're doing it this way. If you have any questions that aren't answered on the paper that I sent you in the document, then that's my way of helping to answer any questions personally. And so feel free to join us on Wednesday at eight o'clock, or you can privately set up a time for me to talk through it, some of the things if you have questions. And um, my last announcement is regarding um, this season, it's really encouraging to see our church being so generous in giving and supporting during COVID-19. And one of the cool things is we have a fund set up at the church level where we've been, use, we've been, we've been collecting resources to bless the community and blessed in different ways. And one of the cool ways we've been blessing is um, we found different, um, I guess you could say medical staff or other opportunities to buy lunches from restaurants to support restaurant business, but also bless the, the care workers, the primary, the care, the care facility uh, workers in different ministries and different um, organizations with lunches as well. So that's something we've been doing. If you're interested in donating for it, there is a, um, in your PayPal link to PayPal into, um, your tithing and your giving, there you can also designate um, by typing in COVID-19 relief fund. If you type that in, um, what you're using that you want to donate the resources for, we'll you know we'll divert the resources to the relief fund and to support different causes and ministries and the people around us to love our neighbor. So those are my three, I think, main announcements. Um, is there any other announcements? I don't I don't think so. 
So with that said, just want to say again, welcome to CFC. Let me pray for us, and then we are going to have Hannah lead us into worship, okay? Uh, Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this time to praise you and worship you. And Father, we thank you that you have brought um, brothers, sisters, all here safely together. We pray that you um, guide us into this time of your presence. May we be able to uh, set aside uh, all the things that are distracting us and simply come and sit with you this morning. We pray, Father, that you encourage each person in this moment, in this season, in this um, hour, and in this time, Lord, may they come to know your love and your grace and your mercy that abounds. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Uh, thank you, Pastor Helicon, um, for, uh, yeah, uh, sharing just kind of what's going on in the life of our church um, and just in this community as well. Um, yeah, um, welcome again to our English uh, worship service. We're glad that you could join us. Um, today's call to worship comes from Psalm 40. Um, and the psalmist writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord, my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will, I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Let's sing. From the breaking, from the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. Words thou were strong to say that will never pass away. I will stand on every promise of your word. For your covenant is sure, and on this I am secure. I can stand on every promise of your word. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation pressing in, I will stand on every promise of your word. You are faithful to forgive that in freedom I might live. So I stand on every promise of your word. Guilt to innocence restored. You remember sins no more. 
So I'll stand on every promise of your word. When I'm faced with anguish, choice, I will listen for your voice. And I'll stand on every promise of your word. Through this dark and troubled land, you will guide me with your hand. As I stand on every promise of your word. And you've promised. And you promised to complete every work begun in me. So I'll stand on every promise of your word. Hope that lifts me from despair. Love that casts out every fear. As I stand on every promise of your word. Not forsaken, not alone, for the Comforter has come. And I stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace. Grace sufficient, grace for me. Grace for all who still believe. We will stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace. Grace sufficient, grace for me. Grace for all who will believe. We will stand on every promise of your word. Um, for today's New City Catechism, um, it is, um, I think, even more so um, a statement of what we believe. Um, so uh, I'll read the question, and then we will answer together. Uh, so the question reads, what do we believe by true faith? And let's all, all answer together. Everything taught to us in the gospel the Apostles' Creed expresses what we believe in these words. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Uh, and let's all read this together. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And let's read Jude 3 uh, together. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Let's sing. gave up his throne the lord of all walked among us he knew no sin yet turned himself in on the mount 
of crucifixion once for all the greatest sacrifice was made once for all his perfect love for us displayed the lamb was slain for all my sin and shame once for all amen sentence to die sentence to die the man jesus christ the righteous king was forsaken the price for sin was laid upon him on the mount of crucifixion and once for all the greatest sacrifice was made once for all his perfect love for us displayed the lamb was slain for all my sin and shame once for all amen three days had passed three days had passed since the lord breathed his last our only hope lay in darkness and the earth gave way the stone rolled away he's alive he has won he is risen and once for all the greatest sacrifice was made once for all his perfect love for us displayed the lamb was slain for all my sin and shame once for all amen it is finished and it is finished it's finished our god has made a way it's accomplished king jesus has risen from the grave it has finished it's finished the veil's been torn away come ye sinners come with me come one come all and say once for all the greatest sacrifice was made once for all his perfect love for us displayed the lamb was slain for all my sin and shame once for all amen Our Father, our Father everlasting, the all creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. 
forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. And I believe in you. I believe you rose again. And I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in life eternal. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe. In the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God. Um, yes, God, that is what we believe. Um, not only believe, uh, that is what we live by, God. Um, God, number one, that you are God. Uh, but also uh, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ to die for our sins, and that on the third day, he arose again. Because of Jesus' blood uh, that was shed for us, we know that we uh, can stand before you uh, through faith, and because of that, that we are clean in your eyes. God, thank you for this grace. Thank you for this mercy that you have shown to us, God. It's not anything that we did to deserve this uh, love that you have shown us, but solely because of who you are and your goodness uh, towards us. So God, this is why we gather. This is why we sing. This is why we worship you, God. So God, thank you for being a God who is beyond um, anything that we could ever imagine. And thank you for choosing to call us your children. We do. And we praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Um, you may be seated. Thank you, Hannah, uh, for leading us in a time of praise and worship. Um, I think, you know, every Sunday as we gather to sing songs of praise, I, I hope that these songs that we sing on a Sunday morning that Sunday morning isn't the only time that we're singing these songs, but these songs are meant to encourage us and to remind us uh, throughout the week. You know, uh, sometimes uh, one of the things that's always encouraging for me is just to know and to hear of you all, like just kind of singing songs of praise God throughout the week. You know, whether you're, uh, well, I was going to say driving to work, but, you know, maybe you're uh, walking to your office at home to work or whether you're in the shower, just to let these songs continue to remind you and encourage you 
of who God is, who Jesus is. And so thank you, Hannah, for leading us in a time of praise and worship uh, this morning. Again, I want to welcome all of you to our uh, online worship service. Uh, my name is Joey Wang. I'm one of the English pastors here. You met Pastor Helicon earlier this morning as he was doing the welcome and announcements. If this is your first time, we're so glad you've chosen uh, uh, to join us this morning. And if you'd like to find out more information, please don't hesitate to contact uh, either Pastor Helicon or myself. Um, for those of you that may or may not know, uh, our, our church theme this year, which we started off at the beginning of January, which seems like a long, long time ago, uh, our church theme this year is building our spiritual home. All right. And this year we've, we've focused on this aspect of building our spiritual home uh, because we believe every building, uh, every home, every house has a foundation. All right. And when we think about the fact that we build our lives on so many different things, uh, so many good things, but yet not the ultimate thing. And even churches oftentimes can lose focus in terms of what we build our church on. And I don't mean physically, but what is the focus of why we gather and why we do what we do, right? And as we all know that in the Christian faith, the foundation of not only the individual Christian life, but the foundation of the church is Jesus, right? It's Jesus. And that's why we've been going through this sermon series uh, through the book of Hebrews uh, titled, Jesus is Greater Than. Right, that we want to go back to this foundation of who just Jesus is, uh, what he has done, and what he taught. Right. And I believe, uh, you know, Pastor Helicon and myself, when we uh, were praying about what book to go through in the Bible, never did we, in our wildest imaginations, kind of foresee uh, kind of the, the current situation that we're in. You know, way back in uh, November and even October and December, as we're deciding kind of our, our next sermon series, uh, never did we think that we'd be doing all this online. Uh, but, you know, as Pastor Hogg and I have been talking and just praying through, we really believe just how relevant the book of Hebrews is uh, for us as a church and for all of you as well. You know, during the season of shelter in place, COVID-19, uh, it's a season of reflection and a season of questions, right? I know for many of us, as we're kind of hearing more updates from a uh, uh, Governor Newsom about kind of the loosening of some of the restrictions and how some counties are entering phase two now and and what does that look like and when will we as Santa Clara County enter into phase two and what about phase three and phase four I think for for many of us now there's this expectation and this longing and this hope that things will get back to normal right we just want some semblance of normalcy right um, because during this season, and I think the longer we're in this season, uh, there's more and more maybe perhaps feelings of discomfort, frustration, doubts, questions, and even just some of the messy, ugly stuff that's kind of surfaced as we've been cooped up at home with our families or even by ourselves, right? And I think for many of us, myself included, my natural response to it as kind of these feelings kind of come up is just to quickly move on. Right? I don't want to think about these questions. I don't want to think about these issues. I don't want to think about this situation. I just want to move on. Right? And sometimes I think we perhaps even in order to move on, we, we like to distract ourselves too. Right? And so we binge Netflix or we play another round, another round of Super Smash Brothers or we constantly check Instagram. Right? It's interesting uh, that uh, alcohol consumption and uh, use has increased significantly during this season as well. Right. And I think I want to encourage you, uh, whether you're a part of our uh, church community or not, but I want to encourage you that during this season of shelter in place, as we're kind of stuck at home, as many of the things that we're used to are kind of taken away from us, that instead of focusing on, okay, I can't wait till this is over. I can't wait till things can go back to normal. Right. That in the midst of this discomfort that you are feeling, perhaps even some of the questions or even doubts that you may be having about God, about faith, or even having doubts about your career trajectory or life stage, all these things, that instead of quickly moving on, that you would actually sit on these questions and actually ask yourself, what is God saying to you during this season of life? What is God perhaps wanting to reveal to you about who he is? perhaps about revealing to you about who you are, perhaps as well. And more specifically, maybe what are some areas of growth during this season, right? I've shared with some of you before that I think it would be very tragic, actually, if we all came out of this season of life uh, no different than when we enter this season, right? I think it would be a missed opportunity, right? And as I've 
you know, kind of heard from some of you, it's really encouraging to see for some of you, you're really wrestling through some of these things and God is really using the season of life to kind of refine you and to grow you, right? And that's such an encouragement. I want to encourage all of you to consider that during the season, what is God wanting to reveal to you? During the season of life, what is God wanting to teach you? During the season of life, what is God wanting to perhaps grow you in, right? And this morning's passage, as we turn to Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 14, uh, as we go through this sermon series, Jesus is Greater Than, and specifically as we look at this morning's text here, uh, I believe this morning's passage is a reminder, right, to us of who Jesus is, right? And what we're going to see in this morning's passage, as we've been looking at the previous weeks, right, is we're going to see more and grow an understanding of the glory of God and the grace of God, right? And so, uh, before we look into God's word this morning, will you pray with me? Will you pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have, God, uh, to gather together virtually online. Lord, that we can worship you, God, and sing songs of praise to you, God. And I thank you, Lord, that even in this season, this crazy season of life that uh, we are in, God, or that you are wanting to do something in us and through us, God. And so I pray, Father, that even right now, uh, as we look into your word, or that we would not take this opportunity for granted, that we would not miss out on what you might have to say to us, Lord, both individually, but also together as a church. And so, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us now through your word, as we read your word, would you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, God, help us to focus now, Lord that we wouldn't be distracted by our circumstances, what's around us, even other windows that might be open right now, or that we would be focused on you. And may you receive the glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's passage, we're going to be reading through Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open up with me, and I'm going to read it out loud, and you can follow along with me. The Word of God reads in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing the ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing the eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is the word of the Lord. I know it's a really long passage. In fact, when you look at verses 11 through 14, it's actually just two sentences, right? And this morning's uh, text, uh, we see, what we're going to see, is we're going to see in the first half, the glory of God. And in the second half of this morning's passage, we're going to see the grace of God, okay? In this morning's passage, as we look through, we're, we're going to see kind of three key points here, okay? And the first is we're going to see in verses 1 through 5, the place of worship, as Pastor Alcon mentioned last week. And we're going to see that in the temple, we see the revelation of God's glory. 
The second point we're going to see in verses 6 through 10 is the priest. That is a reminder of humanity's sinfulness. And thirdly, we're going to see the perfect priest in verses 11 to 14, and that is Jesus, our redemption. Uh, If you've been with us uh, through the book of Hebrews, there's been a lot of uh, verses written about the Old Testament, specifically uh, the Levitical priesthood, right? The Old, Tes- Old Testament system of sacrifice and of worship. And here in this morning's passage in verses 1 through 5, uh, the writer brings us back into attention of the tabernacle or the temple or the tent, which was the place of worship for the Old Testament or the Old Covenant believers, right? That's what it says here in verse 1, right? Now, even the first covenant, that is the Old Testament, had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. And then verses two through five, uh, he kind of goes through uh, kind of a quick tour of uh, the temple, right? And on the next slide, what you're going to see is actually a slide of what the temple looked like, right? This was before they built it, uh, you know, out of stone, all these things, right? This was kind of the move, moving tent or tabernacle, right? Uh, and what we see here is that there was this outer court where people could go, right? But then on the next slide, what you're going to see is a, a close-up of uh, the tent or the tabernacle, right? That it was divided into two sections. Uh, when you pass through the first curtain, that was the holy place, okay, as it's, as it's described in verse uh, two, right? And then beyond that first curtain lied a second curtain or uh, a veil, uh, which led you into the most holy place, or as some Bible translation translates it as holy of holies, right? And as we look at verses two through five, we see that it's basically describing the elements there, right? That, you know, things were made out of gold, right? That there was bread there, there was candles, there was an altar, there was Aaron's staff, there's the Ark of the Covenant, all these different things, right? And I think before we move on, usually when I read passages like this in the scripture, it's like, okay, okay, great. I kind of have a picture of it. Now let's move on. Right. But I, I want to pause here this morning because I believe when we look at the tent or the tabernacle, this place of worship, uh, that when we look at all these things, all these elements, these descriptions, these components, they were meant to reveal God's glory, that they were meant to describe the glory of God. Right. That when we look at these elements here, right, first of all, they were made out of gold and they had these cherubim of glory. Right, that as we look at the description of this temple or this tabernacle or this tent, that it was to show us God's majesty, right? To show us God's majesty. That as you went in, right, you would see ornate items out of gold and shining, right? And not only that, we know that in the holy place, uh, there are candles, okay? But in the holy of holies, there is no light source. And that was supposed to remind the priest, right? that God's presence was majestic and glorious, that you didn't need any light source, that God himself was the light, right? I remember after graduating from college, uh, my immediate family plus my maternal grandmother, uh, we were fortunate enough to go on a trip or a tour of Europe. My grandmother had always wanted to go, always wanted to go. And I was, you know, I just graduated from college and I think my parents thought, who knows when as a family we may ever do like a trip together again. And so we took a, uh, I think it was like a 14 day trip, a whirlwind tour of Europe. And we, you know, visit all these different countries, saw all these different, you know, touristy sites. We saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Colosseum, the Eiffel Tower, London Bridge, the Louvre, all these things. Um, but one of the things that stood out to me when I look back on that trip was we had the opportunity to visit uh, many different cathedrals. Uh, we were able to visit St. Peter's uh, Basilica in the Vatican, right? And if you've never been there, or perhaps you've seen pictures of these amazing cathedrals, it's, it's when you step in, uh, you get this real sense of how small you are, right? That these cathedrals are just so amazing, just so overwhelming, right? How high they are, how big they are, right? The, 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 the beauty and intricacy of, of, of just all the craftsmanship there, right? And you just feel small. And there's a sense, real sense, right, of God's glory, God's majesty, right? And that's what uh, the temple, the tent, the tabernacle uh, that is being described in verses 1 through 5 was meant to convey, right? God's glory, God's majesty, right? Not only that, we also see God's presence, right? That it was in the Holy of Holies where God's presence was supposed to be, right? We know that God is everywhere, 
but that there was this real kind of sense and awareness that God's presence was kind of concentrated in the Holy of Holies. All right? And not only that, that as they entered the temple or as they thought about the temple, it also revealed God's holiness. Right? That these curtains right, were meant to divide and to separate. Right? That not anyone could enter. In fact, it was only the, the high priest that could enter that first chamber, that first area, the holy place. Right? And it was only the high priest who once a year could enter into the Holy of Holies. And when we think about the tabernacle, it revealed God's holiness, that God was set apart, that God was distinct, that God was different. But not only God's uh, distinctiveness, right, but also his perfection and his purity. Right? That you had to be ceremonially clean right, to be able to enter into the holy place and the Holy of Holies. But not only that, when we look at the descriptions here in verses 2 through 5, we're also reminded of God's grace and mercy. Right? When you look at verse 5, it talks about the mercy seat. Right? That was where they were experienced God's grace and mercy. Right? The mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Right? And we also see in verse 4, it talks about the Ark of the Covenant. Right? That was basically a golden box where you know, the, 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 uh, the Ten Commandments, right? the covenant, uh, tablets were stored as well as Aaron's staff. And you'll notice here in verse four, it also ha contains a golden urn uh, holding manna, right? Uh, the daily bread or cracker-like items that the Israelites ate, right? In their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, right? Then when we look at the items in the Ark of the Covenant, that it's a reminder of God's covenant and faithfulness, right? How God had rescued his people out of slavery, right? Out of the land of Egypt. And God had led them to the promised land. Right? And, what I, and so what we see here in verses 1 through 5 is that everything about the tabernacle, the tent, the temple, it was to reveal and to remind uh, God's people, right, God's glory. Right? That they would be overwhelmed with the sense of who is this God that we worship. Right? Right? And when we... Read scripture, and this is even a practical point. You know, whenever we read the Bible, a lot of times we read the Bible and we say, well, I don't really get anything out of it, right? But as you've heard me say countless times, the Bible is primarily about who God is, right? The commands of God reveal to us who God is, right? And what, so what I'm saying is that everything about scripture, everything about this tabernacle, this tent, was to help people to see who God is, right? What is God like? Right? And that's the first point we see here, right? is that the place of worship, the, the tabernacle, the tent, was a revelation of God's glory. But of course, as soon as we think about God's glory, right? as soon as we think about God's holiness, God's perfection, God's grace and mercy, God's faithfulness, right? it leads us to the second part, verses 6 through 10. Right? Uh, and here in verses 6 through 10, it highlights the priests or the people. Right? And it's a reminder of humanity's sinfulness. Right? Anytime we're confronted with or reminded of God's glory, we are also reminded of humanity's sinfulness. Right? That everything about the tent, the tabernacle, revealed God's glory, but also a reminder of how short, how fallen uh, God's people were. Hence the need for priests and a high priest. And we see in verses 6 through 10, right? it goes through and talks about the priests. Right? That on a daily basis, uh, the priests would offer sacrifices for people's sins in the holy place constantly. Right, morning and evening, right, and then we see here, as we mentioned before earlier and read before earlier in Hebrews, right, the role of the high priest who once a year would enter into the most holy place, right, and actually here it highlights here that he didn't just go once; he would go twice. Okay, so the first time the holy the, the high priest went into the most holy place, he would offer a sacrifice for his own sins, so therefore he would be pure. Okay, and then he could come back in. And then offer a sacrifice for the people's sins. And what was interesting is that normally the high priest would wear kind of a, a priestly robe uh, that was purple in color and very ornate. But on the Day of Atonement, just once a year that he would go into the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies, he would wear a simple white robe. Right? That the high priest, even as he were to go into the most holy place and encounter God, okay, and offer the sacrifice to God, that he was physically and visually reminded, right, that he was just an ordinary person, that he was much of a sinner as the people that he was offering sacrifices for. Right? 
And what we see here in verses 6 through 10 is this reminder of humanity's sinfulness. And I think in the church we talk a lot about sin, but oftentimes I don't think, I don't believe we actually have a very clear definition and understanding of sin, right? And so oftentimes sin is described as like missing the mark or the target, right? Oftentimes we think of sin as disobeying or breaking a commandment or a rule. And while that is true or captures part of the definition of sin, I don't think it captures the entire uh, aspect of what sin is, right? Uh, next, I want to show you a definition of sin, which I've found very helpful for me over the years by John Piper. It says, sinning is any feeling or thought or speech or action. Notice here, it's not just an action, it's feeling or thought or speech that comes from a heart that does not treasure God above all all other things, right? Notice here, this definition of sin, right? It's, in essence, not worshiping and recognizing God as God and valuing and cherishing God. It isn't just about not doing certain things or doing certain things, right? It's not just an external act of right sin, but sin can very much be a part of our emotions and our thoughts and our feelings as well, right? Uh, John Piper continues, he says, uh, sin is when the glory of God is not honored. Sin is when the holiness of God is not reverenced, right? Sin is when the greatness of God is not admired. Sin is when the power of God is not praised. Sin is when the truth of God is not sought. Sin is when the wisdom of God is not esteemed or recognized. Sin is when the beauty of God is not treasured. Sin is when the goodness of God is not savored. Sin is when the commandments of God are not obeyed, right? Sin is when the faithfulness of God is not trusted, right? Sin is when the promises of God are not believed. Sin is when the justice of God is not respected, right? Uh, sin is when the wrath of God is not feared. Sin is when the grace of God is not cherished. Sin is when the presence of God is not prized and the person of God is not loved, right? Just take a moment and look at this slide here. Right? That sin isn't just about breaking God's commandments, but all these different things. Just take a moment and just pause and think about in what ways have you sinned or what ways are you sinning even today or this past week? Right? Looking at this aspect of what sin is. Right? You see, sin includes a breaking of a rule or commandment, it includes external actions or inaction. But it's so much more. Sin isn't just actually breaking a relationship with God or breaking God's heart, right? But it's not treasuring God. It's not worshiping God as we ought to. Not just in our actions, but in our feelings, our affections, our thoughts. It's all encompassing. Right? And that's why the Bible constantly reminded and continuously reminds us today that we're all sinners. We all fall short, right? Of not recognizing and worshiping God as we ought to, right? And the temple, the tabernacle, was a constant reminder of this, right? And I think this truth here isn't just for non-Christians or new Christians, but for all of us. I think in this day and age, we minimize sin, and as we minimize sin, we minimize the grace of God, right? And I think all that is actually tied to because we have a minimal view of the glory of God. Because we have a minimal view of the glory of God, we have a minimal view of our sinfulness, and consequently, we have a minimal view of God's grace to us through Jesus, right? When we look at, when we see how majestic God is, as we see how perfect, pure, and holy God is, as we see how gracious God is, as we see how faithful God is, as we see how powerful and beautiful and worthy of worship God is, then, only then, will you and I begin to understand and to see our sinfulness more. Right? And that's what we see here in verses 1 through 10, right? It brings up the tabernacle, the tent. That on one hand, it revealed God's glory, but it was also a constant reminder to people of their sinfulness. Right? And that's what we see here in this passage. But then we see in verses 9 through 10, as well as verses 11 to 14, 
He points us back to Christ, the perfect priest, Jesus, our redemption. You see in verse 9 and 10, when you look at verse 9 and 10, it says, According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Right? And what the writer here is saying is that all these physical acts of sacrifices, right, atoning for their sins, right, that they were just mere physical actions. Right? That ultimately, these actions cannot cleanse or clear their conscience. Right? That they could do all these physical requirements, but ultimately, would it clear their minds and would it really clear their hearts? Right? And you see this word conscience appear in verse uh, 9 and then also at the end of this passage of verse 14. 14 it says, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so what is the conscience? What is the conscience? Uh, Kevin DeYoung in his excellent short book, which has a really long title called The Art of Turning from Sin to Christ for a Joyfully Clear Conscience, uh, says the moral faculty, he's defining what a conscience is. A conscience is the moral faculty within human beings that assesses what is good and bad, right? It's like our Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio, right? And, and DeYoung continues and he says, our conscience acts as both a prosecuting attorney that is, our conscience oftentimes convicts us, right? When we do something bad, we feel our conscience kind of, oh, right? Like we feel bad, we feel guilty, we feel ashamed. Oftentimes that's our conscience kind of prosecuting us like an attorney. But our conscience can also be, or can also act like a defense attorney too, right? You think about a time that maybe someone falsely accuses you of something, right? And kind of, it's kind of weird. In your mind, you're kind of like, no. I didn't do that. I know I didn't do that. I, you know, I, I, I'm innocent, right? That's also your conscience kind of acting as a defense attorney as well, right? And so our conscience, on one hand, persecutes us or prosecutes us, but our conscience also defends us, all right? Uh, in Romans 2.15, uh, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 2.15, uh, he says, uh, they show that the work of law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them, right? Here you see this aspect of our conscience can either prosecute us, accuse us, or it can excuse us, right? That our conscience is kind of this witness to us that we feel, right? This feeling that we all have, right? You and I, we all have a conscience, right? Uh, and it reminds us, right? Sometimes it, it kind of pokes us like, man, you know, uh, that piece of garbage you just threw into the garbage can and it missed and it's on the side, you should go pick it up, right? And that is kind of our, our conscience speaking, right? Oftentimes conscience and the Holy Spirit kind of uh, work together in that way, okay? Well, one of the things that we see here that I want to just take a couple minutes to unpack, though, is our consciences, your conscience, uh, don't always work the way it ought to, right? Doesn't always work the way it ought to. And 1 Timothy 4.2 reminds us of this. Right. First Timothy 4.2 says, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Right. And here the Apostle Paul writes as he's writing to Timothy, right? he says that because of sin, oftentimes our consciences are kind of distorted. Or here he uses the word are seared. Basically, you know, when you think about searing a steak, right, you're putting high heat right, to it. Right. And basically the idea of searing is that the, you know, it's, it's blazing hot. And when you see it, something is seared, basically like the nerve endings, it doesn't feel anything anymore, right? And it's this idea that oftentimes our consciences uh, can be desensitized, right? In other words, sometimes when it comes to certain sins, you actually don't feel guilty. You actually don't feel any shame. And it's not because you know the grace of God. And it's not because you're clinging to the forgiveness you have in Jesus. It's actually because your conscience has been seared. You have become numb, right? It's like a GPS or a compass, uh, right? That's way off, right? It's saying north is this direction when in fact it's this direction, right? In other words, don't delude yourself into thinking just because you don't feel guilty about something, just because you don't feel convicted about something, that you are okay with God, and that there isn't real sin in your life, right? 
You see, I think for some of us here this morning, as we are listening to this sermon, I do believe some of your consciences are way out of whack. It has been seared. It has been desensitized, right? And that even as we talk about sin, as we talk about guilt, you don't feel anything. You're like, I'm not that bad of a person. Right? And maybe you're not that bad of a person. But are you sure? Do you treasure God as you ought to? Do you do the things you ought to? Are your affections aligned with what God desires of you? And I think for some of us, our consciences have been seared or hardened. And this is where we need the word of God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to read God's word. We need to let the Holy Spirit recalibrate our consciences. We got to let the Holy Spirit recalibrate our GPS, right? But I believe for some of us, others of us, actually, instead of having a hardened conscience, I believe some of us, we have a hypersensitive conscience, Right, And so every little thing, we're wondering, oh my goodness, was that sin? And we feel guilt and we feel ashamed for things that have happened years ago, right? Things that we have already asked God to forgive us of, but yet even this morning, as you're listening to me speak, you feel guilty about certain things. You feel ashamed about certain things, right? And what we see here is that some of us may have a hardened conscience, but I believe others of us here this morning, we have a hypersensitive conscience. And I want to encourage you, right, as this morning's passage in verses 11 to 14 remind us and encourage those of us for whom perhaps we have a very hypersensitive conscience, right, that you can stop feeling guilty. You can stop feeling ashamed, right, that as you have already acknowledged and repented and turned to Jesus in those areas that you feel guilty about, you feel ashamed about, you feel embarrassed about, right? Know and believe and trust that you don't need to carry that weight or that guilt or that burden or that shame anymore. And stop trying to make up for it yourself. You see in verses 11 to 14, it says that Jesus himself has offered the only payment, the only sacrifice, that is himself, that he has carried that weight, he has carried that burden. And that is why in Hebrews 10, 22, it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, right? The truth is, and the fact is that we can come before God with a clean conscience, right? Not because we've done everything right, right? not because we haven't sinned, right? But rather because of who Jesus is, that Jesus as our high priest, our, our intercessor, our mediator, right, also offered himself as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. You see, the Old Testament system of sacrifices, right, uh, it can never ultimately cleanse or clean or clear someone's conscience, right? Um, I was thinking about this kind of as an analogy in some ways, and this isn't perfect, but I think about our prison penal system, right? Um, you know, uh, People go to prison for many different things, but it's interesting that the punishment uh, for their crimes, or in some ways, the ways that they atone or make up for their crimes is by being incarcerated, right? Think about that for a moment, that if someone were to take the life of someone, right? Someone were to kill someone, right? How do they make up for that crime, right? Uh, is, well, they go to prison, right? And depending on the nature of that, murder, whether it's manslaughter or first degree murder or second degree murder, right? They can get anywhere from like just, you know, 12 months in jail to life or even the death penalty, right? And that's the way kind of our society deals with crimes, kind of the penal system, right? But let me ask you this. Think about this for a moment. Does a person spending time in prison for many years, does that actually make up for the murder the crime, the life that that person has taken, right? When you think about it, 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 it can in some ways, but then it also doesn't, right? A person could spend the rest of their lives in prison, right? And still potentially feel guilty for that crime, even though they've done their time, right? On the other hand, someone could spend their life in prison and never feel guilty or bad about that crime, 
And so like, okay, they spent their time, but has that made up for what they did? Right. In many ways, I think when we look at the Old Testament system of sacrifice, right, that it kind of did make up for people's sins, but also ultimately did it, right? Because it was a matter and issue of the heart. Right? And that's what verses 11 to 14 point us back to, right? That Jesus, as our perfect priest and our perfect sacrifice, he achieves your and mine and our perfect redemption. Right? And this really is the gospel message. This is the gospel message, that as we look at God's glory, that we are reminded of our own depravity, our own sinfulness. But yet, as we look at our own sinfulness, we look back to Jesus, and you and I, we are reminded, right, of his, not only his glory, but his grace to you and I. And this morning, before we close, and as we close, and before we, I turn the time over to to Hannah to lead us in a song of response. I want to give you just a couple minutes, uh, just in silent reflection and prayer, wherever you are. Right? I just want to encourage you just to, to close your eyes and to consider and what are the areas in which perhaps your heart has become hardened or desensitized to sin? Do you perhaps have a hardened conscience? Right? And if that's you, just to spend some time asking that God would soften your heart that you would begin to cherish and love the things of God, right? that your heart would become more sensitive to the things of God. And perhaps for some of you, you know, you have a hypersensitive conscience, right? You always hear this, this voice that's accusing you of all these things that you've done and things you should have done and things you should have said and things you didn't say, right? And even though you've kind of, come to God before, you still have this kind of cloud of guilt and shame over you. And I want to encourage you right now just to pray to God, asking God through Jesus to just wipe that away, that you would not just know about forgiveness, you would not just know about this idea of having a clear conscience, but that this morning you would begin to experience it and to live life with a clear and free conscience because of who Jesus is. And so let's just take a few moments in silent reflection and prayer, and then I'm going to invite Hannah uh, to lead us in a song of response. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that even as we read your word and hear your word, God, even in the season of life that you're in, God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to pause and to reflect on who you are. God, that in the midst of just constantly being bombarded by other things, Lord, that we would hear your voice, not just our own voices or the voices of our own thoughts and our own feelings, Lord that you would draw us back to you, that we would see more of your glory, your majesty, your goodness, your faithfulness, your holiness, your justice. And as we do, Lord, that your spirit would open our eyes, God, to more of our sinfulness as well, Lord. And as we do, Lord, that we would experience and know your grace in greater ways, Lord. I pray for my brothers and sisters and the friends that are joining us online this morning, Lord, that as, as we live life during these uncertain times, Lord, that we would know you more, God, that we would cherish you more, God, that you would continue to work in our lives during this season, Lord, that we would not rush through it, God, and return back to normal, Lord, but that we would be changed people, Lord, by your grace and for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, 
thank you, uh, Pastor Joey, uh, for reminding us of God's truth. Um, yeah, if you haven't already, please rise uh, as we just sing and respond to what we just heard. Once for all. Once for all, the greatest sacrifice was made. Once for all, his perfect love for us displayed. The Lamb was slain for all my sin and shame. Once for again purify my heart purify my heart in your presence teach me to discover the joy of holiness that forms as you draw me close in you what was lost is restored so I will The highest need has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean Oh, I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest need has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean Uh, let us continue to praise God uh, through the singing of the doxology. Please remain standing as we close in prayer, then with the benediction or Lord's blessing. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, where we can worship you, God, through music and song and through the reading and hearing and preaching of your word. Father, thank you, Lord, uh, that we are reminded, Lord, of who you are in all your glory. God, we're also reminded of our sinfulness, but ultimately, Lord, we're reminded of Jesus and who he is and what he has done. And Father, I ask, Lord, that as we conclude this time together, Lord, that as we uh, go back to our, our, our lives, Lord, that you would help us to walk in freedom, God, in forgiveness, with a clear conscience, Lord, that seeks you, that honors you, God, in all that we do. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen and amen. Again, we want to just uh, thank you for joining us uh, for our online worship service. Uh, Pastor Alcon, is there any other announcements or things we need to let uh, people know about? Um, just a reminder that if you have questions about the, your journey growth group and you've been signed up to a group, then um, please feel free to join the meeting on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock uh, regarding it. At this point, we're, our, 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 our signups are closed for this chapter, unfortunately, because w- once we build the groups, you know, it's hard to add people in because we want to keep the groups cohesive. So, um, but if you are ex- in- interested in signing up in the future, come talk to me. I'd love to add you in one day um, in the future to the groups. And if you're interested in buying the book, let me know. I have ordered 35 copies. I don't want to own 30 copies for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I've saved you guys trouble. I ordered it, got a good deal on it, $10. You might have to come pick it up. Or I can, might be able to deliver some of them, but, you know, it'll take some effort. We can work on some sort of middleman communication thing. Um, but it, it, it's one thing I wanted to say, Pastor Joey, thank you for your message. I think it's interesting how to, to look at the balance between sensitive, sensitive, hypersensitive versus desensitized, you know, consciences. And I, for some reason, I wrote it down, The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's high school book. So you guys, most of you high schoolers probably know what I'm talking about, but that conscience that just haunts him right haunts his crime it, it, it just to me that always kind of captures the imagery of the guilt that could be in our hearts so yeah just a thought <laughs> yeah. thank you for sharing yeah all right if you haven't um also just a reminder that we do have our sunday school classes uh, that will be starting at 11 30 so hope you can hop on board and join us and also as pastor Alcon mentioned earlier we do have a town hall meeting next sunday during our Sunday school class hour starting at 1130. So we'll be providing some updates uh, about some of the different things going on in our church, as well as, you know, as we think about transitioning back to and kind of just an opportunity for us to uh, catch up with one another and for uh, us as a leadership, pastors and elders to update you on some of the things going on in our church as well. So again, we're so glad you joined us this morning. Uh, You experienced God's peace and grace uh, this day and this week.